I went into 12 minutes with a very optimistic disposition. I didn't know much about the game, I had only seen the previews and occasional trailer put out by Xbox Marketing. After all, being a day one Game Pass title made it a lot easier to justify spending the 4 hours it took to beat it. And so, I decided to spend one of our Friday streams over on Twitch going through this mind-bending Groundhog Day simulator. There are a couple of things you need to understand about the game before we deep dive into it though. For one, this is a point and click puzzle game. Secondly, it's about a man caught in a time loop. And thirdly, it features some incredible talent on the acting side of things. Namely, James McAvoy, Daisy Ridley, and Willem Dafoe. The reason it's important for you to understand these things is because most of the complaints levied against 12 minutes are simply grounded in the accuser's dislike of one or a combination of these three components. You will hear a lot of people saying that the game is too repetitive, which we'll address that in a moment, but I find it to be somewhat funny an accusation considering the game is literally about a time loop where the same thing happens over and over again. It's like somebody criticizing PT because the hallway looks too similar from the cycle before it. Or someone could say that the game feels too stiff, to which I would reply, it's a point and click puzzle game, what the hell did you expect, you troglodytic buffoon? The point is, I think there are issues with 12 minutes. For Christ's sake, you can probably tell just by the title of this video, but it's important when we criticize a very unique game like this that we do so fairly and even-handedly. How often do we have a game that's designed and put together only by a handful of people that features A-list talent at the helm? A game like this can do a lot to mature, sophisticate, and validate our industry. And it's not to say that you should treat it with kid gloves, but it is to say that callously criticizing it because you simply don't like these kinds of games could do more harm than simply damaging the sales numbers. But all of that being said, in this video I want to run through my thoughts on the game. I played through the whole thing over on Twitch in a single sitting. If you want to see that stream make sure to check out my Twitch channel which will be linked in the description box below. The VOD should be available for the next couple of months at least. And while you're at it why don't you throw me a follow over there, I'd love to see you in one of our streams. Hell, right now as you're watching the video I may be streaming come by and say hi. Now be warned, there will be spoilers in this video. If you have ever spent any time thinking about playing this game yourself, and especially if you have Game Pass, pause this video and go play it. Like I said, I was able to get through the whole thing in four hours. You can get through it in an evening, and this video will be here waiting for you when you get back. I promise, I'm not going anywhere, and if you're looking for my Spark Notes opinion of the game, I would simply say that if you can get the game on Game Pass, you should absolutely give it a shot. If you don't have Game Pass and would be forced to spend the $25 they're asking for it on the open market, I would say that you should only play it if you're someone who likes this style of game, specifically puzzle games that have mind-bending stories. I'm not joking, if you play this game and don't have a headache by the end of it, you probably weren't paying attention. But to be honest, I don't think anybody should be buying this game outright. Not because it's terrible, but because for $25 you could get Game Pass for a month, play this game over a Saturday evening, and then spend the next month playing all of the other games that are available in the Game Pass library, and then at the end of that, you'll have 10 bucks left over. It's yet another example of how Game Pass is changing the way that we evaluate these things. What previously could have been a wait for sale recommendation is now much easier to make as a Game Pass edition. Just give it a try, why not? But with all of that said, I wanna get right into the video after we thank our sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is the online learning community for every type of learner. Whether you want to improve your video editing, Photoshop skills, or learn how to paint, Skillshare has lessons taught by industry professionals to help you achieve your goals. I've spoken about it before, but I struggle with time management and work efficiency. So going out on a limb, I looked for these classes on productivity, and sure enough, there was this course taught by Thomas Frank on productivity for creatives specifically. It has everything from lectures to creativity boosting drills, and it works. And right now, Skillshare has a deal where they will give the first 1,000 people who click on the link in the description box a free one-month trial with unlimited access to thousands of inspiring classes that you can use to hone your craft or learn a new one. Check them out at the link below. Okay, so 12 minutes 
opening starts off quite innocently. You take control of a man who's coming home after a long day's work. After you leave the elevator, the first thing you're greeted with is a rather visually stunning carpet. I immediately recognized this as the carpet from The Shining. This immediately gave me an uneasy feeling. After all, imagery in horror movies is designed to make you feel just that. Horror. To see one of the most visually unique carpet designs that is inextricably tied to one of the most influential horror movies and stories of all time innocently placed in a hallway leading to your apartment should, at the very least, make you question why it's there. This is actually one of those moments where over-analysis actually works in the developer's favor. The more the player thinks about the carpet and what it means and why it's there, the more uneasy they will grow, fulfilling the very purpose of its existence in the game. But setting that aside, you find the apartment door locked. Look to the left and discover a hidden key in the plant, which you then use to get into your humble abode. This simply serves as the tutorial section, giving you the rundown on the point and click navigation and how the player can use items in their inventory in the world by dragging them onto specific objects. It's incredibly simple, but will allow you to do a lot over the course of the game's runtime. Inside, we see our apartment. It's very basic, consisting of only three rooms. There's a studio living room and kitchen, a bedroom, and a bathroom. After entering the apartment, we soon meet our character's wife. She's humming a pleasant melody in the bathroom as she gets ready. And once she discovers you've returned home, she greets you with a kiss and tells you that she has a surprise. She's prepared your favorite dessert and tells you to get her when you're ready for it. This gives you a chance to explore the apartment a little, though at this point there's not much to do, at least as far as you can tell. You can interact with objects in the same way you will later, but for the most part, you're just excited to get to dessert. Once you're done exploring, the two sit down and share those treats that she's prepared. She goes into the bedroom to retrieve something and gets shocked by the light switch in the bedroom. It seems innocent enough, but every little thing that the characters reference will be important. For instance, your wife makes an offhanded remark that you need to clean the closet at some point. What could be excused as simple filler dialogue is actually a subtle attempt by the developer to push you into exploring the closet and seeing it for yourself. Inside, you will discover her cell phone in her purse, which will be necessary sooner than you may think in order to progress. And this was really refreshing. Maybe it's just because I'm coming off of Assassin's Creed Valhalla and that massive critique, links below. But to finally have a game which has extremely lean dialogue was awesome. And to be honest, it shouldn't be surprising. I'm sure having this star-studded cast was not cheap, and every line that was recorded had an associated cost. A lot of filler dialogue would be wasteful, not to mention it simply isn't necessary. 12 Minutes really does a good job of this. Almost everything you see and hear will be useful later in one way or another. Regardless, as the two share their dessert, your wife reveals the real reason that she made the dessert and is so excited to see you home. She brings out the present she retrieved from the bedroom and tells you to open it. Inside is a onesie for a baby and it simply reads, Dahlia. Now beyond the obvious implication that this is her way of telling you she's pregnant, even the word printed on it will be important later, regardless of how contrived it will seem later on. For now, just remember that the name Dahlia is simply a reference to the player character's mother's name. Granted, the wife doesn't know what gender the baby is yet, and won't know for another few months, but she still hopes it's a little girl, which is why she put this name on it. I think is the justification anyways. But don't worry, we'll discuss this more later. Soon after learning this news, there's a knock at the door. It's a large, bald, bearded man who you will immediately recognize as being played by Willem Dafoe. He says he's a police officer and that he needs to come into the apartment. Once inside, he binds both of you with zip ties and begins demanding information about a pocket watch that your wife must know about. Furthermore, he says that she is responsible for her father's murder eight years before, something that she, of course, denies. Still, the strange man insists that she knows where the pocket watch is and that she's hidden it somewhere in the apartment. After initially denying it, your wife comes around to tell the strange man where it is, but not before he begins choking you out. Right before she's able to say where it's hidden, you are incapacitated and the loop begins again, with you entering the apartment just like before. Now this is established as the basic loop that we will be going through for the next four hours. If you are killed, knocked unconscious, run out of time, or simply try to leave the apartment, it will reset. Any items or physical effects to your person are left behind in the previous loop, except for knowledge of what you've learned. This means if you learn something about one of the characters, you can challenge them on it in the next loop. And this will be important because you will need information from your wife who won't give it up unless you can prove that you are actually trapped in a time loop. 
In order to prove it to her, you have to collect items such as the pocket watch, which you find in the bathroom underneath the medicine cabinet, or the present that you take out of the bedroom. And thankfully, discovering these isn't just a matter of searching and randomly clicking on stuff. There's actual dialogue that hints to where objects are or outright tells you based on what you do to set up the loop once more. For instance, I assumed that my wife was not explaining to the cop where the pocket watch was because it would implicate her in her father's murder and she didn't want to do that in front of me. So I tried coming right into the apartment at the end of the loop and going straight into the closet that she referenced earlier and closing the door. And because my wife was in the bathroom when I first got home, she doesn't realize I'm actually back. So she comes out, sees that I'm not actually home and sits on the couch simply waiting for me to return. After a few minutes, the cop arrives. When she answers the door, he does the same thing, zip tying her and demanding that she tell him where the pocket watch is. This time she quickly gives in and tells him that it's simply underneath the medicine cabinet hidden in the vent. This tells the cop, but also the player, where to find it in subsequent loops. And then of course, because he's a bad guy, he comes back out, kills her, sets it up like a suicide, and leaves. And I have to say, there's a lot of really hard to watch moments in this game, depending on your choices. Over the course of the run, you're likely to try any number of things, from trying to stab yourself, shoot yourself, or watching your wife be killed by the cop in horrific ways. There's even a loop where she gets electrocuted and dies in the bedroom. And I I'd say this is probably a good indication of the power that this game has in both the writing, but perhaps more importantly, the performances. The fact that these undetailed character models flailing around in a puddle of blood has such an emotional impact shows just how real they are to the player. Now, setting that aside, you won't be able to get very far with just dialogue options. You will need to use the objects that you find in the apartment in creative ways to change the circumstances surrounding the interaction with the alleged cop. For instance, the cop reacts differently depending on whether or not it's your wife in the room, you both are in the room, if it's just you in the room, or if there's no one in the room and apartment and he's forced to break in. And so, pretty quickly, the player will try to alter this circumstance by getting the wife out of the room, refusing to answer the door, attempting to call the police from the wife's cell phone that you found in the aforementioned closet, or even setting your wife up to be electrocuted by the light switch in the bedroom, like I mentioned before. In fact, if the player character is electrocuted by the light switch the second time it's turned on, you will be knocked out for a minute or two, but not killed. However, if your wife flips the switch the second time it's turned on, she will be killed instantly because she's not wearing shoes, meaning that the current can flow all the way through her and complete the circuit. If this happens, the strange man is left baffled as to what to do. He needs the information that she has, and so with her dead, he's left with no way to make progress. And also, the player character has a line of dialogue when he realizes that she's been shocked and wasn't wearing shoes, and this will be important later. Like I said, almost all of the dialogue in here is useful. In addition, you don't have to kill your wife to see a unique instance of the man in the apartment. You can find sleeping pills in the drug cabinet in the bathroom. You can then use cups that you find around the apartment, fill them up with water in one of the sinks, dilute the pills in the water, and then serve it to her while you share in that dessert. And if you pull this off, your wife becomes extremely tired and goes to bed. This lets you run to the closet, hide, and once the strange man breaks his way in and finds her in the bedroom, he approaches her and switches the light on to see if she's alive or dead. But if you recall, the second time the light switch is flicked on or off, it will either incapacitate or kill the individual depending on whether or not they're wearing shoes. Turns out the cop is wearing shoes and so he's knocked unconscious by the shock. What the? Hi. Uh -huh. This gives the player time to rush the body, remove zip ties, the gun, the knife, and his cell phone from the cop's inventory. You can then use the zip ties on the man to restrain him while you talk with him and retrieve more information. Furthermore, you can go through his phone and the text messages therein to discover his true motivations. Turns out he has a daughter who has cancer and they can't afford the medical bills. He has text messages from the insurance company saying that he hasn't paid, the hospital is texting him, telling him he needs to pay, and his daughter is a little worried that they're not going to be able to complete her treatment for her cancer because 
Her dad doesn't seem to have the funds. And this jives with the other dialogue we've heard from the cop, where in he said that the pocket watch was extremely valuable. And one of the cooler discoveries I had in the game was when I thought to click on the phone number that's listed in the text messages app, and it turns out you can call that phone number. Oh, Dad, the movie's about to start. I'll call you back later. I told you to call me earlier. Love you. And this is a huge advantage that you'll need to use as you work through the next few loops. This because you can call the man's daughter and tell her what her father is about to do, at which point she calls him in the hallway as he gets out of the elevator and can significantly change his behavior, even to one point that after a certain set of dialogue options are chosen, he has a change of heart and promises not to hurt them. And he just turns around and leaves out the elevator. That's right, you can get it to the point where the cop just never comes in at all. And no, that's not the solution that ends the game and rolls the credits. It's actually kind of surprising. Once you figure that out, you think you've just achieved the goal. You avoided the cop killing you and your wife. But no, the time loop is going to keep going. There's a lot more. Now, if all of this sounds incredibly intricate, it's because it is. There's a lot going on here. One of my favorite things in video games is when I think, I wonder if this will work. And then it does. And this game is filled with instances of this phenomenon. It's why it's so important to go through it with no spoilers or as few as possible. And it's also why I cannot recommend that you use a guide to work through it. I know it's a puzzle game, but it's a puzzle game that relies on the player's creativity and ability to think outside the box. And the little emotional fulfillment that the game offers is only found when the player achieves this for themselves. I know some people get upset when you suggest there's a right way to play a game, but in this case, I'm going to stand by my judgment that you should just play the f game. No guides, no calling your friends for help, just play it. You will get stuck, but when you finally figure out how to progress, it's going to be one of the most satisfying feelings you've had in a long time. For instance, you may think initially that the goal of the game is to either kill the intruder or keep him from entering the apartment and just leave you alone, like I said earlier. But you will realize very quickly upon doing so, after he's knocked out by the light switch and zip tied, and even after you stab him with the kitchen knife while he's passed down on the floor, it doesn't actually end the loop. And so you're forced to dig deeper. And sometimes this would be a bad thing when you feel as though a game is about to end, but it just keeps going and going and going. But in the case of 12 minutes, I don't think it actually overstays its welcome. The issue with the game's ending here is not when it comes, but rather how. You see, about four-fifths of the way through the game, you will reach a point where you convince the intruder that your wife did not kill her father, that he can have the watch and you don't want it, and that you're pretty sure you know who did kill her father. Specifically, that it was likely the bastard child from her father's affair with the nanny. At this point, the man leaves to sell the watch so that he can pay for his daughter's cancer treatments. He says that he will continue digging to discover who actually killed her father, who he was very close to, and you and your wife are left alone in the apartment, extremely happy. You have a baby on the way, you no longer have a lunatic trying to kill you, and your wife is free from the guilt that she murdered her father unintentionally. But remember that I said that this was only four-fifths of the way through the game. Well, that's because this isn't the end, even though everything is screaming that it should be. I know, it seems as though this would be the happy ending, but pretty soon you're going to discover more information that makes it extremely clear that none of this is what it seems. I'm going to explain exactly what's going on here in just a second, and I feel it important to stress that I'm not making up any of this or exaggerating a thing. The game really does pull all of this out of left field at the last minute as some sort of curveball or twist to hook you for its final moments. Unfortunately, it comes out feeling very contrived and not very reasonable within the world and story that you've just spent three and a half hours becoming familiarized with at this point. What's this plot twist to which I'm referring? Well, again, I'm not making this up. You are your wife's brother, and your incestuous relationship was the spark that set off the fire, which led to both of your father's murder. Look at this. Cute. What? Say so what? The, the name. Look at the name. Is what that the, the nanny? Who? 
the nanny from the old man's affair. What? Oh, yes. D Dahlia. That's it. Her name was Dahlia. No, 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 no. Why are you Please, saying God. this? Is some guy saying this? Dad. This is funny to you? Huh. She, she was my mother. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. Oh. Wait, no. 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 <laughs> What? Your father insisted that the relationship be broken off, but during a scuffle that took place in the midst of the argument that ensued, he was killed by the player character. So, in one fell swoop, the game has taken that happy ending and turned it into one that is a lot less happy and a lot more disgusting. Happy married relationship? Nope. Your brother's sister love sauce has brought an inbred baby into the world, and on top of all of that, you're a murderer. Or, at the very least, guilty of manslaughter. Now, I have one question about all of this. Why? If the game had ended where I thought it would, everybody would be happy. It would have felt like a conclusive end to the story, and we would all go home feeling happy and fulfilled. Perhaps even hopeful of a sequel where we find out who actually murdered her father. But instead, we are put through this diatribe of contrived plot nonsense to give us some sort of shock at the last minute. It would be one thing if the story had an interesting or meaningful message driving all of this, but as far as I can tell, it doesn't. In fact, the first ending that most people will get is called Alone. And you get this ending after speaking with your father in a flashback, telling him that you love your sister wife, but that it would be best if you both parted ways and if you simply disappeared. And this causes the credits to roll. And then it just resets you to the main menu. Now from this main menu, you can click continue once again, which transports you back into the elevator that we saw at the beginning of the game. But this time it leads to a small hallway that ends in a single door instead of the three we had before. You use your key to go inside inside and find it to be the same apartment, but completely empty. If you leave the apartment, it brings you back to the main menu. And I think this is when most players will stop. If you keep exploring the apartment, you can eventually find the pocket watch and the same vent in the bathroom, and then you have to use the minute hand and drag it to the point where it's two minutes before 12, which is the same time that you saw right before the credits rolled. And then once the second hand catches up, you're transported back into the core loop that you were in before the ending. And I kept playing after we figured this out on stream, figuring that there was something new to be discovered here. There had to be, but as far as I can tell, it's simply a way to hunt for achievements and get different endings without having to go back through the entire game again, which is what can happen with a couple of other endings, such as the one where you can point out to your father that you've read the book that's on the shelf behind you, which happens to be the same one your wife was reading on the couch. You have to have gone through the book after taking it from her inventory while she's dead or passed out, or you have to talk with her repeatedly about the book in order to trigger the messaging. But after you get this one, you'll have to go through the entire game again to discover a different ending. Ending. But to be honest, that's not that big of a deal because most people will only find this ending on the second attempt or after using a guide, in which case they will probably know what they're getting into. But going back to the central point of why. I really hate when stories do this. The author has the ability to craft a story in any which way they choose. They can have a happy ending, a sad ending, an unsatisfying ending that sets up a sequel. It's completely up to them. And so to choose to go this route isn't just baffling. It borderline ruins the entire experience. What could have been a satisfying ending that leaves everybody feeling fulfilled in the time that they spent with this small cute game with a star-studded cast is replaced with confusion and a lack of clarity. I can't even tell you how many people were in my chat over on Twitch confused as to whether or not the game was actually over. It's one thing if somebody plays an MMO and doesn't know when they've hit the wall, but it's entirely different when it's a narrative experience. Furthermore, when a plot twist like this is revealed, it causes the viewer to reanalyze everything they went through before this. And this can be fun. You look back through everything you went through the first time and see all the hints that pointed towards the twist from the beginning, but this only really works when the twist naturally evolves from the storyline and isn't 
simply contrived and forced upon the players in the story for sake of shock value. Probably the worst instance of this would be the onesie. Remember at the very beginning of this video I said that it would feel very contrived? Well, this is how you actually discover that your brother and sister. Your wife makes an offhanded comment when you ask her why she put your mother's name on the onesie to announce her pregnancy that she thought it would be meaningful to you. Now, at the time of this recording, my wife in real life is nine months pregnant. We're going to have a baby any day now. I know it's crazy. Trust me, I am more nervous than you are. But the reason I bring it up is because I think this is giving me some authority to say that this is a very weird thing to do. Announcing that you're pregnant to your significant other by way of a onesie is a cute thing to do. No one's questioning that, but it's really freaking weird to put their mother's name on the onesie in big, bold letters. I love my mom, but if Nikki announced to me that she was pregnant by handing me a onesie with a big Catherine going across the front of it, especially when we never discussed that as a baby name or anything, I would find that strange. It simply doesn't make sense. Maybe I'm the weird one here, but I don't think I am. People don't do this. But in order to get this big reveal working so that there can be a plot twist where you are your sister's lover brother, the game's developer knew that he needed something that would tie the beginning of the game to the end so that it wouldn't feel as though it was just coming completely out of left field. And at the outset, that's a good idea. Tie the beginning to the end so it doesn't feel so surprising. But just because the initial idea and intention is good doesn't change the fact that the thing you're referencing at the beginning of the game didn't make any sense back then either. And what's really frustrating about this is it would have been extremely easy to fix. Instead of having Dahlia printed on the onesie for some inexplicable reason, they could have simply had a picture of his mother on the wall of his apartment. They have paintings everywhere. You can even interact with these and look at them closer, but for the most part, they don't factor into the story at all. All it would take was a picture of his mom on a nightstand or on the wall that you can take off, add to your inventory, and then hand to the strange man instead of the onesie. It would have achieved the same exact thing, but would have made way more sense. People have photos of their loved ones in their living spaces. They don't print onesies with their significant other's mother's name on it. And this is just one example of many where things like this exist. They are very contrived, placed in the world or in the story purely to set up something else, but they don't make sense in the first place. And this is why I find 12 minutes so frustrating, because it does some things really well, and then other times it's unbelievably cringy while it's trying to set up some big twist. While every single line in the game may be important and reference something later on, it's easy to overlook the simple fact that some of these lines didn't make Makes sense to begin with. Now, the other issue that we touched on earlier was the topic of repetition. As previously stated, this is a game built on repetition, so it's important to understand that I'm not criticizing the game for reusing the same space or requiring the player to repeat certain actions. In fact, there are many ways that the game increases the efficiency of gameplay in order to reduce the repetition as much as possible. The clearest example of this would be the first time you explain to your wife that you're going through a time loop. This first time, you have to provide evidence showing her the watch and the unwrapped present, proving to her that you know what's inside even though it hasn't been opened yet. But as the game goes on, this three to four minute exchange is shortened into a single dialogue choice where instead of explaining by way of items of evidence, you explain what's going on by referencing her father's murder and explaining details that you couldn't have known otherwise. And this makes sense because it would be just as satisfactory as the prior method of proving that you were stuck in a time loop. But sometimes the game fails at this, or does it so sloppily that it causes more confusion than concision. For example, towards the end of the game, when you're speaking to the cop, you initially have to explain that your wife didn't murder her father because you have a picture of her on New Year's Eve, the night he actually died, hundreds of miles from the murder scene. You have to physically show him the picture. He has to walk up to the fridge and look at it himself. And then you have to explain to him how she couldn't have done it. All after calling his daughter to loosen him up and force him to listen to you. At which point he believes you and leaves. However, in later runs, in an attempt to save you time and the frustration of repeatedly explaining all of this, the game removes this proof requirement and instead has the wife 
just calmly explain that she didn't do it. And of course, that she's so sorry for his loss. This, however, results in a serious change in behavior for the cop, because just an hour or so before this in-game playtime, this same character, who is now very understanding and willing to admit his mistakes, was zip-tying and then shooting your pregnant wife before setting it up to look like a suicide and leaving. This is what I mean when I say that the game bends over backwards to make plot points work even when they don't make sense in the context of the world. The onesie doesn't make sense, and it doesn't make sense that this man would be so willing to believe the word of who he believes is a murderer simply because she's convincing. I get why the burden of proof was cut from this sequence. It would definitely add a lot of bloat, but the way it was trimmed down almost causes more harm than good because it makes the bad guy seem completely different from how he was before. But when the game isn't trimming itself down to remove repetition, it embraces it wholeheartedly. And this is where the repetitious criticism is very valid. I couldn't even count how many times I simply had to reset the loop because I forgot to do one simple thing or didn't know that I needed to do it until the game arbitrarily decided it at the end of a loop. Such as this time. We had just spent three to five minutes explaining to the cop that the wife couldn't have killed her father because she wasn't anywhere near the murder scene on the day that it occurred, blah blah blah. He seems dismissive and asks simply if he can have the watch. After all, that's the reason he's here. And I was like, yeah, absolutely, I don't even want the damn thing. But I didn't have it in my inventory. Instead, I had left it in the vent where it is at the start of every loop. The cop, however, was unwilling to let me get the watch or even tell him where it was so that he could retrieve it to make sure that I didn't have any weapons stashed close by. And so, instead of believing me or letting me retrieve the watch, the cop killed us both. And at first you might be like, well, he was simply watching his back and didn't want to risk you grabbing a weapon while he retrieved it or while you retrieved it. But this doesn't make sense because in other loops, he's willing to let the wife retrieve the watch or he retrieves it himself before returning back to the couple in the living room. It's inconsistent. For some reason, not having the watch in your inventory in this specific loop causes a a fail state that resets everything and wastes about five to ten minutes of your time. But in multiple other loops, you don't need the watch in your inventory during the interaction with the cop because he will either retrieve it or have the wife retrieve it. And this is just one silly, stupid example. There are multiple times where something very simple and arbitrary like this can spoil a loop and force you to reset. Thankfully, it's not a huge deal because the loops are only 10 minutes long at the max, and if you ever want to manually reset, you can just walk outside of the apartment, but it's still an issue nonetheless. There isn't some minimum amount of time required to to make wasting the time of the player a bad thing. It doesn't matter if you waste five seconds for a slow fade in for a big logo at the booting up of every single session, or if you force the player to reload after a five to 10 minute sequence for an arbitrary reason. Either way, the same sin is being committed. Now, at long last, we should acknowledge the elephant in the room. This game was built with a very small team. Spearheaded by Luis Antonio with help from a small team of artists, the game certainly didn't have the resources that you would typically see in a game that's received this much hype. But when we critique a game, it doesn't matter how many people worked on it or were available to fix the issues with it. Whether it was made by one person or thousands, we are all paying the same money to play the game. So I think it's fair to call these things out when we see them. Now, it's not like the game is super buggy. Sure, I ran into two individual instances of the cop experiencing a pathing issue and even freezing in place locked in a walking animation, but these were were quick speed bumps that were quickly forgotten because he eventually was able to figure out his way out of this stuck position and progress continued. And the only other bug that I encountered was when me and my wife went to the bedroom to get all schnazzy and the cop knocked on the door right as we laid down, but the only character that seemed to have heard it was the wife. So she got up to go answer the door and left me in bed, but the animation still played out as though we were making out together. It's honestly, it's pretty funny. I'll just let it play. No, don't get it. Get it. <laughs> <laughs> he's, oh, he's caught in an animation. He's making out with a pillow. Mm. Calling my family. Mm. No more games. Mm. Hands behind your back. Oh. Now. Mm. Hold still. <laughs> Always. 
this is one of the more un I her dialogue is still playing. What is going on? <laughs> help me. Will you come help me? Don't fucking move. <laughs> <laughs> you? Hands behind your back, please. Don't move. Don't... Oh god. This is a mistake. Okay, so. Babe, will you tell me? But in spite of those three bugs that we encountered, two of them being the same thing, I have to say that the overall feeling is that 12 minutes is pretty robust and polished. Other than a few stiff animations, it really does a good job of establishing and excelling within its art style. But at the end of the day, we have to evaluate this as a product on the open market. As a Game Pass day one title, this thing is a home run, I think. It's short, punchy, and has some genuinely cool moments. It really butchers the landing and leaves the player wondering what the point of everything was, but for an evening of entertainment, it's a great ride. Not to mention the performances by James McAvoy, Daisy Ridley, and Willem Dafoe are all fantastic. But like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, 25 bucks is only really justifiable if this game really appeals to you. And to be honest, for $25, you really should just sign up for Game Pass for a month, play the game over the course of a weekend, and then spend the rest of the month enjoying everything else that the service has to offer. And then at the end of that month, you will still have enough money left over to go buy yourself a Trenta Caramel Frappuccino with seven shots and extra whipped cream. Listen, I like this game. It's impressive in a lot of ways, but it has a lot of flaws as well and it's far from the meaty thriller that it was supposed to be. If there is meaning to this story, I don't know what it is, which I think is pretty damning when you think about it. After all, if you're trying to communicate a message by way of a story, but no one knows what that message was after experiencing the story, I think you failed. But insofar as the journey to the destination is concerned, where the destination is lackluster, the journey is actually pretty engaging, fun, and even memorable. But that's it for me. Thank you for watching. I love you all, and I'll see you in the next video.